Hi, welcome back. I hope you're all keeping safe and well. So in place of my usual teaching, I've been asked to create a lot of YouTube videos to help people with the curriculum, but I also thought this would be great as an opportunity to fit in with the Greek tragedy series I was putting together anyway before work took over. So welcome to all the new subscribers since we've been in lockdown, and today's video is going to really focus on Euripides' Helen. Now, Helen of Troy is a figure we feel like we all know really, really well from Homer. You might have known her from the film Troy or from just general pop culture references. She's really, really well known. And the story we feel we all know about Helen is that she falls in love with Paris, the Trojan prince. She's perhaps a gift given to him by Aphrodite after Paris judges a beauty contest. So you may or may not have heard before of the judgment of Paris, where Paris has to choose between Athena, Aphrodite and Hera. Having chosen Aphrodite, he claims the prize of the most beautiful woman in the world and receives Helen of Troy. So Helen leaves Sparta where she's married to Menelaus um, and follows Paris over to Troy and sets up an illicit affair with him. And for this reason, Helen's known not only as the most beautiful woman in the classical world, but also as the most devious, the most adulterous, the most immoral. And that's why she's such a key figure for women in the ancient world. What Euripides does is he takes that story, turns it on his head and said, but is Helen really like that? Do you really know Helen? What if Helen never went to Troy at all? So Euripides' Helen is a tragedy that completely rewrites Helen as a figure. And the interesting thing about Euripides, you'll know from the chorus video I did a few weeks ago, is that he's really interested in women characters. He has a lot of female choruses, and he has a lot of really dangerous female figures in his tragedies. And in 412, Euripides puts Helen on stage in her own tragedy. Now, this isn't the only time we meet Helen. Euripides puts Helen on stage in The Trojan Women, and he puts her on stage in Orestes as well. So he has more interest in Helen as a figure. And in Euripides' play, it's really bizarre the way he rewrites the myth that we're all, or we all believe to be, so familiar with from the Odyssey and the Iliad. So in Euripides' Helen, Helen is never Helen of Troy. She never went to Troy at all. And what happens instead is that Euripides replaces Helen with a phantom. So a phantom Helen goes to Troy with Paris. The events of the Trojan War unfold in exactly the same way. The real Helen, the actual Helen, is spirited away to Egypt. So Euripides' Helen is completely set in Egypt and it's a story about Helen lamenting what's happening in the Trojan War, worrying about her reputation, but also really seeking a way to reconcile with her husband Menelaus because she loves him and she wants to return home. In the meantime, she has a problem with the local <laughs> Egyptian king, Theoclamenus, who really wants to claim Helen for his own bride. So rather than seeing Helen be consistently adulterous and running off with another man, we actually see Helen really trying to stay faithful to Menelaus in really dire circumstances. So today what we're going to do, now that we've got to grip with the myth of Euripides' Helen, is focus on the way this myth unfolds in um, the opening passage of the tragedy to give you an insight into women in the ancient world. Not only does Euripides put Helen on stage, he gives her what we call a prologue. A prologue is the first part of a tragedy that really sets the tone for the version of the myth that the tragedians adhering to, and remember myths had lots of different variants. Um, and also, it sets the tone for who's in charge, who gets the prologue, who's going to start to drive the narrative. And Euripides' Helen, Helen comes out herself. The first line is really striking in Euripides' Helen because it primes Euripides' audience for this total relocation of Helen. This is a myth they might not have been familiar with elsewhere before Euripides. There are lots and lots of authors whose work we don't have anymore. So the lyric poet Stasicorus is somebody who was writing in the 6th century and a lot of his work doesn't survive. He provides a lot of mythical variants. So it's unclear how much this would be a total Euripidean innovation and how familiar Euripides' audience would be with it. But it's certainly unlike the more dominant narrative of Helen going to Troy herself. So when Helen comes out, her words are so beautiful, so chaste. It immediately kind of undermines receptions of Helen so far, 
The audience might not know it's Helen speaking, but they may well expect it, given that they know the title of the play. Um, and Helen's certainly not chaste. However, she's referring to the Nile. So she says, this river Nile waters the plain of Egypt with white snow instead of rain from heaven. So in the first two lines, Euripides has totally twisted the audience's expectations of this woman because they've sat down with a lot of prejudices. Helen's really often referred to as the bad wife throughout all of Greek literature. So Euripides is really rewriting Helen as a character. Um, she goes on to say, I would like to tell the things I've suffered once for the sake of beauty, three goddesses met Paris in the cave. So here we have the judgment of Paris narrative that we mentioned before. Um, and Helen's job throughout the play is to help herself meet Menelaus and then <coughs> for them to return home. So Euripides gives Helen the prologue, she starts to twist expectations, we know the setting is in Egypt, and this is where we start to see the more fantastical elements of Helen unfold, because Helen is really unusual in that it's one of Euripides' escape tragedies. Now Euripides' escape tragedies include Iphigenia in Tauris, um, Euripides is Helen, obviously, the Orestes has an escape, escape element to it, and these are tragedies in which not everybody dies at the end the way that you would expect them to um, but it has a lighter ending and some people sort of consider these tragedies to be more like romances like Shakespeare's romance tragedies or romance plays that we see later like The Tempest so they're a bit unusual and a bit bizarre but they don't have that typical tragic tone. Eventually Menelaus does arrive in Egypt and he arrives completely shipwrecked by chance <clears throat> There is a recognition scene between Helen and Menelaus and immediately then they have to get into cahoots about how they're going to con Theoclymenus and how they're going to leave Egypt together successfully. So whereas typically Helen is against Menelaus or Helen is undermining Menelaus, so in the Iliad for example she doesn't seem to engage with Menelaus, she's kind of, if she ever says anything positive about Menelaus in the Iliad she tends to be putting Paris down and that's really the context for that. So she doesn't seem to say anything good about Menelaus on his own merits, it's rather to manipulate her new lover. Um, but in Euripides as Helen, she's really in cahoots with him and they come up with a plan together. Um, so we see this recognition scene between Helen and Menelaus at line sort of 550 and onwards where they start to recognise one another. Um, and at first Menelaus doesn't want to believe that this is his Helen because he's been dealing with the phantom Helen over in Troy and he says, I never saw a woman more like her. Um, he's, and Helen says, and you're like Menelaus, I can't speak. So we have all this irony as the couple reunite and we have an unusual or an unlikely love story between a married couple who are typically, you know, the how not to do marriage couple <laughs> in Greek myth. And eventually they hatch a plan to leave Egypt by convincing Theoclymenus that Menelaus is a shipwrecked soldier and he's come to tell Helen the news that Menelaus has died um, and therefore she's now eligible and able to marry Theoclymenus, king of Egypt. And Theoclymenus kind of buys this because for one thing he's finally going to marry Helen, he knows he's marrying a steadfast woman because she's now eligible and she's waited until she's eligible and although that's inconvenient for him that actually becomes part of her value in the play of Helen which is very unusual. Her characterising feature is that she's steadfast to Menelaus and it becomes ironic because for Theoclymenus it's inconvenient but it's part of Helen's quality as a woman and part of what makes her such a desirable wife. The flip side of that is it's what makes her so devious <laughs> from Theoclymenus' point of view. So Euripides has really twisted some of our expectations of Helen as the devious woman. She's still leaving somebody behind, she's still tricking somebody, she's still running off with a man, but she's doing it with her own husband and she's treating the guy who's trying to take her away from her husband. So Euripides has presented a kind of mirror image of the Helen that we were really expecting. On the one hand she's very virtuous, but on the other hand, in service of her husband Menelaus, she does a lot of deviant things that we might associate with Helen anyway. So in order to allow the escape plan to take place, 
Helen um, promises that she's going to go and do a sort of ritual at sea to honour Menelaus and she and Menelaus in disguise demand a ship and lots and lots of resources from Theoclymenus. And they dupe him by saying, you know, this is just how the Greeks do it. This is a Greek practice and you're Egyptian and you wouldn't really know anything about it. And so Theoclymenus actually in the end gives them the ship that they need to leave Egypt. Okay. So I hope that that was a helpful overview of Euripides Helen for you and for you too. Don't forget to like and subscribe to keep the channel going. Um, and I'll be back with more content on Greek tragedy throughout the lockdown. All right. Thanks. Bye.